what are microplastics? Where are they from? And what impact do they have on creating disease? Yeah, so microplastics are, are really an interesting topic. I talk about this, by the way, I haven't mentioned this yet on my platform on social media called The Smart Human, um, thesmarthuman.com, but also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, now Clubhouse, probably TikTok soon. Oh my God, my head is spinning. And then of course I have a podcast called The Smart Human Podcast that I hope people will tune into because I speak with some really interesting uh, doctors and environmental health specialists and lawyers. And it's kind of really kind of cool. But anyway, um, uh, you asked me about microplastics. So microplastics are basically what it sounds like. So very, very small, teeny tiny pieces of, of plastic, so small that you can barely see them. And in many cases, you can't see them. Um, and I can't remember the micron size, but they're pretty darn small. Anyway, we get microplastics um, in many ways into our bodies because we consume foods with them. Um, we, um, are in oceans that have, you know, they break down plastics in our oceans, break down to microplastics through sun exposure, through wear and tear of the ocean, um, you know, through any mechanism you can imagine, but they break down over time because again, plastics don't have a strong enough matrix. Um, and so that's how they break down and get into our bodies. Um, and then they get into fish and they get into our seafood and the food we eat and many countries rely on. And they get into the, the muscle tissue of fish and seafood and, and shellfish. And then we consume them. Now, we're not really quite sure. I don't think the studies are really fully out to show what that means to human health. Because again, it's association, not causation for many things. Um, but it can't be good to have plastics in our body. It's not anthropologically appropriate. Um, it's in beer. I did a whole, um, if you like to drink alcohol, I have a whole section on alcohol where I talk about chemicals and alcohol, what to look for, and how to avoid it, and some of the brewery rules in Europe versus US. And it, it's been found in, in honey, it's been found in beer, it's been found in um, drinking water, certainly, um, especially tap water that's made into bottled water. So we are getting exposed a lot from just the food and drink industry. And then we do it from our, our food, um, seafood. Um, and really the question is, why do we do this? Also, another interesting thing, I did a whole thing about um, coffee and tea. We get it from tea bags. When you heat up non-organic tea, non-organic coffee, um, you're releasing all those chemicals, manufacturing, um, pesticides into that hot, healthy cup of green tea or whatever you choose but you're also getting microplastics. And this has been tested and I post on this on the Smart Human among other topics. Um, and that was actually a particular post that got a lot of attention because it's a well done study. And in fact, you know, those tea bags are made often, not always, but often from um, plastics like rayon, very soft, like similar to um, a, a pantyhose or stockings. So we wanna really think about what we heat to high temperatures and then ingest, thinking it's healthy for us, but we really wanna break it down to make it healthy est. And we do that, it's not hard to do. What are potential long-term impacts of cumulative exposure to contaminants and hazardous materials? What's the difference in impact between a single exposure event and multiple exposure events over a longer period of time? And please describe the process of how a material can be considered safe in a single use and then not safe after a repeated number of uses. Yeah, I think the big question here is why do some people get sick and some people don't? You know, in general, it's exposomics. It's how the exposome or our genetics respond to, you know, not just our genes that we, you know, are born with, but also what does our lifestyle do to affect whether diseases get expressed or not? Um, and what do foods and exposures, even if they're, you know, once or a thousand times do to our um, risk for disease? And really what it comes down to is um, what we now know is, you know, you're born with your genes, just like, you know, you can't necessarily change your actual gene structure on your own. Um, just like you can't change your in-laws, just kidding. Um, but what happens is lifestyle, diet, nutrition, smoking, sun exposure, stress, light, sleep, lifestyle affects the proteins that are in our genes that allow those genes for a disease to be expressed or not. That's called your exposome. And we go into that in the book very clearly to understand that. So what we do have control is what 
affects our proteins that are like the stops or the, or the plugs that either let those genes get expressed or stay quiet. So you're not always going to get Alzheimer's if your family has Alzheimer's. You're not always gonna necessarily get cancer if you're, you have family members with cancer risk. Unless it's genetic, that's a whole nother discuss, discussion of BRCA genes and genetic component. Genetic component with breast cancer, for instance, is 10%. It's pretty strong, but 90% is environmental. A lot of people don't know that statistics is well known now. 90% of people who get breast cancer has a, an environmental component that can be worked with. Um, and so that's the idea is we can control our lifestyle, our exposures to some degree chemicals if we can do that. Um, but we can't always control our actual genetic um, makeup. It's just the components, the proteins that, that allow them to be expressed. Our, our development of disease is a dance between three things, genetics, lifestyle, and exposures. And what we can control is not our genetics necessarily, but our lifestyle and our exposures is what I'm trying to teach and what the literature supports. Um, so that's, that's really what I say is that, you know, just because you get gene tested and you have a gene for Alzheimer's or you have a gene for something doesn't mean it's going to be expressed and you can actually work pretty easily to remove some of those exposures. And again, low levels over time, like, you know, endocrine disruptors are infinitesimally small parts per million, parts per trillion, parts per, but it's these low level exposures over time that increase risk. And because they're like hormones, they work at very tiny levels to create a lot of change. So they have this kind of an exponential physiologic effects. So again, reducing, reducing, reducing is all we got, but it's not hard to do. So why not do it? What chemicals, you've mentioned chemicals in our food, which foods are they in and, and are we protected if we eat organic? That's a great question. So, you know, most people would agree. I mean, most common sense would say the processed foods, um, you know, fast foods, processed foods that are packaged, they tend to have many more chemicals, right? Because they have to be shelf stable. They have to have preservatives. Um, if you look at an ingredient label, which by the way, in the book, in the food chapter, I give all sorts of hacks to how to read a label. I mean, the labels are confusing as well. But when you know that the first ingredient is the most um, quantity in that product per serving versus the last thing on that ingredient list, that's important to understand. Um, to look and see which ones are preservatives um, is important to understand. To understand produce and understanding the label in produce in supermarkets will ask you tell you if it's organic or not just with the numbers. And I want to teach people that as well. So the idea is that if you have the ability to suss out labels and, and marketing through packaging, you are really well ahead of the game because you can make much better decisions based on knowing the industry and how it works. Um, organic is phenomenal. I do recommend as much as people can afford it, have access to it. Organic is the only regulation in the US that has any teeth when it comes to our food in terms of safety or risk. It does allow certain pesticides, but they're, they're you know, really low on the list in terms of harm. And there are far fewer that are allowable in the general market. So getting organics that are frozen are far cheaper than even organic fresh. Buying organic produce in season makes it cheaper. Um, and yes, you are removing a whole host of pesticides, um, genetically modified ingredients, which is a whole nother topic. Um, so yes, I do, I do recommend uh, organic. I don't always get organic for certain products, um, like Environmental Working Group has a, a Dirty Dozen Clean 15 list, which is in the book, 2020's list. They look at produce across the country and they measure residues, pesticide residue, residues of non-organic produce and see which ones tend to have the most residues versus not. It's always strawberries and apples are almost always the bad guys every year. Um, but you can look into that and you can choose things that are not organic, like asparagus is often low in that, in that list for the clean uh, 15. Um, and so again, having these tools available will help you decide if you need to get organic or not. If it's a watermelon and a cantaloupe with the skin and a shell, perhaps that's even a better choice than berries or peaches that absorb chemicals from their skin quite readily and that's what you're eating. So again, we walk through all of that in this book, um, but I understand cost issues and access. Um, this is a real big issue. So if you, now big box stores are actually having their own organic line, so I encourage that. 
Um, so definitely go with big box stores that are now doing it themselves because they know it's lucrative and they know people want it. Thank you.